So good to see you. Welcome, Norton. You're looking good. Thank I'm glad you. the new the new the new digs or the new situation is suiting you so well and everything. Harold, thank you. I'm glad to be here. Always good. And in the audience, welcome very, very much to conversations. Those of you with any regularity would be familiar with our current guest. That's Norton Mizvinsky, uh, PhD. Uh, we've always introduced him over the years of having done a number of programs with him as being connected uh, with the uh, Central uh, Connecticut, Connecticut State. State University where he's a professor, a distinguished professor Thank you. and so forth. He's retired from there and he's now the president of the International Council for Middle East Studies, which I guess is headquartered in Washington That's and right. doing research and understanding things. He's been very active. He's very familiar with the situation in that part of the world. We're going to be talking about that and other matters. Matters. Norton, so good to see you again. Thank you, Harold. Again, it's good to be here. Why don't you just real quick run down your background? I know you were involved with Elmer Berger. That's when we first met and that sort of thing. A little bit of your background, then we'll get down to the current. We want to talk about the flotilla and Hamas and other things. But Well, uh, I've been for well over half a century mm -hmm. uh, a professor of history, mm -hmm. and I have dealt with certain aspects of American history, but I've dealt mostly with the modern Middle East, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, my major emphasis has been uh, Arab-Israeli conflict and all of the various aspects, and I also have dealt a good deal with Judaism. Mm -hmm. I've taught it, uh, I've taught those subjects, I've done research and have written, I'm still writing, uh -huh. and now I'm involved uh, with the International Council for Middle East Studies, uh, which uh, has uh, within its context uh, a good many of the outstanding uh, academics around the world okay. who deal with the Middle East. You've probably been in touch with some of them over your career. I've been in, in but uh, yes. a, new, a, new a number of them are uh, people friends. with our old friends mm -hmm. and uh, so that also helps. I had a I had pleasure watching a DVD put on to me giving a talk up at uh, Central uh, Connecticut. And it was really interesting, among other things, I understand you were, you can, as I understand, you can read or work with the uh, Yiddish and oh, also yes. with Hebrew. Oh, that's right. So that's a, that's a mark of some uh, well, linguistic capability. I hadn't realized that you were able to handle those languages. Well, it's hard uh, to, uh, it's difficult yeah. to um, uh, try to do serious scholarship uh, within a certain area where languages are important without knowing those languages. There's a lot of sources in English. Yeah, that There are a lot of sources in English, yeah. that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's good to be able to use the primary sources. Have you, have you always, since being, let's say, a young man on up, been interested in the Middle East? Seems to me that is probably the most dangerous area in the world as I see it. I'm not sure if I'm right in that, but well, that's certainly a, a central point of concern with anybody interested in improving or preserving the human condition? There's no question about my interest. Mm. I uh, grew up in the middle of Iowa, of all places. I grew up in a very religious, Ames? I grew up in Ames, Iowa. Ames, Iowa. And, a, and my uh, parents were um, uh, Orthodox Jews, uh -huh. although uh, we were for a long while the only Jewish family in town. The uh, only? For a while, we were the only Jewish family. In fact, Harold, I was born, <laughs> before I went to Ames, yeah. I was born in a small town in Red Oak, Iowa, uh -huh. and uh, we were not only the first Jewish family, I was the first Jewish baby born in Red Oak, Iowa. Wow. So, of course, at eight days old, <laughs> when I had the bris or the circumcision, <laughs> that was a big thing. My father threw a party for the whole town, no, and right. so on the ninth day, yeah. that was headlines in the uh, newspaper. Local Newspaper. of Red Oak, Iowa. Well, have you got copies of that? I have, you I have, have a copy, wait, that? I have oh. a copy of that uh, under plastic bris. <laughs> in a bank in yeah. Ames, Iowa. Yes, I hope and, it's well guarded. Yes. Uh, it's well guarded, uh -huh. and somehow, mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm so vain <laughs> that I think somehow it'll be really worth a good deal <laughs> yes. of money. It's worth a yes, good deal to right. me without right. the monetary consideration. Yeah, yeah, but it's like, it is, that sucker's gonna yeah. sell it. Uh, so th so yeah. anyway, that yeah. was the start. Yeah. Uh, when I was growing up, I had more relatives in the state of Israel uh -huh. who had come from Europe uh, uh -huh. originally uh -huh. uh, than I did anywhere else. Uh -huh. When I started the university uh -huh. as an undergraduate at the University of Iowa, uh -huh. I intended to do what we call in Hebrew, my Aliyah, finish four years and go to Israel to live. And when I was a junior, after I'd taken some history courses, right. one day I asked myself a question. 
Could it be that in a conflict this large and significant, yeah. one side, namely the Israeli Jews, yeah. were and are 100% right, and the other side is 100% wrong? And would you and if, Wait, and if my dear father <laughs> yeah. were alive yeah. and with us today, yeah. uh -huh. he'd probably say something like, from his perspective, it was all downhill for me after I asked that very <laughs> basic question. I see. So then, yeah. wait, so yeah. then yeah. Uh -huh. I asked myself, how many Arabs did mm. I know? Mm. And we didn't have any then in Ames, no, Iowa. I, I knew that. five. Yeah. And they were all in Israel, and they had been introduced to me uh -huh. by my relatives, whom I knew were the most chauvinistic, Israeli, right Zionists that existed. I knew something about what an Uncle Tom meant in the United States. Yeah. So I figured those five had to fit that category. Uh -huh. And if I was really interested in furthering my knowledge, yeah. I'd better go out and meet some Arabs who were not introduced to me by my relatives. I'll be That's how it started. And, and how, and how did you find I, them? Where did you well, find them? Well, I found them. I went to graduate school. Mm. I, Where did you went, go graduate? I, I went to the University of Wisconsin. I got my PhD Madison? in Madison. Uh -huh. In After history that, or in Middle I East? I got East? it in history. Uh -huh. And I did a minor in Semitics. And uh -huh. they just started a Department of Jewish Studies. Okay. And I was uh, one of the first two graduate students doing work there. Congratulations. And then I went to Harvard on a postdoc. Grant, right, and right. I was able to study with very good people at Harvard, yeah. and I went on from there. How did you connect with uh, Elmer Berger? I'll tell you how. When I was an undergraduate, yeah. in my senior year, when I was in a history honors program, right. I decided to do a an undergraduate honors thesis, which uh -huh. we had to do, uh -huh. on what I then called anti-Zionist propaganda in the United States. Uh -huh. And when I did the research, to my then amazement, mm -hmm. I discovered there was one, only one, American Jewish organization that advertised itself as anti-Zionist. It was called the American Council for Judaism. Mm -hmm. The executive director at the time was Rabbi Elmer Berger. I yeah. found his name. Yeah. I wrote him a letter. Uh -huh. I told him uh, that I wanted some information. I was very surprised. He immediately sent me a long letter and lots of information. Mm -hmm. I then wrote the chapter and I tried to refute all the arguments of the American Council for Judaism, right. which were Elmer Berger's ar uh, arguments. Uh -huh. I then sent him a copy of it when it was done because right. he had helped me. He then wrote me back uh, we didn't have computers then. No, he I know. Wrote I me back, electric, he wrote yeah. me back a three-page, single-space type mm -hmm. letter. Mm -hmm. I could tell that he wrote it back with sort of kid gloves on mm -hmm. because he really gave it to me. Uh -huh. He tore me apart in terms of all my arguments, uh -huh. nicely, yeah. cordially, yeah. and he then said, if and when you come to New York, please look me up, I'll take you to lunch and we'll continue our discussion. So about two months later, I went to New York, mm -hmm. I took him up on the offer, we went to lunch, we, that's how it started, mm -hmm. we became close friends, mm -hmm. and in 1967, uh -huh. Some years later, uh -huh. I became the executive director of the American Council for know. Judaism. I didn't know and that. he, when he became uh, what he called the the president uh, or the vice, or, so that's yeah. how it started. Uh -huh. And then I became very close to Elmer Berger. Yeah. And in fact, in this sort of field of uh, 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 Arab-Israeli stuff, uh, yeah. Zionist studies, many people will say, "Look, Norton Mesvinsky is the protege." of Elmer Berger. Well, That's not exactly true, uh -huh. but it's not um, very far away. When you it. wrote that thing to him, did you have a brief or you had a situation or an idea, a mindset in terms of everything like that? And were you in accord or not? Or no, were you I was trying not in to bring accord. Him down I had asked myself that so basic question. you made question. a shift somewhere. I, did, I, had yeah. made, I had asked myself the basic question previously. Yeah, right. So I was in the questioning stage, yeah. but I still was certainly within the full Zionist context. Right, yeah. And so when I wrote on anti-Zionist propaganda, uh -huh. I was opposed to it. So in that chapter on the American Council for Judaism, mm -hmm. I made my attempt to refute the position. And as I said, yeah. Elmer Berger very nicely tore me apart. <laughs> and Adroitly. That, uh, 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 and that's how it started. Oh, yeah, right. He was a big influence and like that. And you've been there and you're writing so well and there's so much going on there. I just threw out a line there saying that might be the place in which I worry still, even though some people say it's uh, all over and everything like that, uh, the threat 
of the weapons of destruction that exist within the uh, planet. And uh, I, I think that uh, that area might be the most dangerous area in the world for us to address in order to avert the unleashing of what seemed to be like, I'm not sure, but from modeling, the species lethality of the weapon systems that exist among us now. Well, what do you think? Do you think that's true, one thing? And if so, is that I the most dangerous I area, th well, singularly? I think this. Because of number mindsets one, and so forth. Number yeah. one, there is a basis for that kind of worry. Mm -hmm. And number two, certainly we have at least one large supply of nuclear weapons in that area, and that's within the state of Israel. Uh -huh. um, yeah. uh, we don't know the full extent of it, mm -hmm. but we know that um, uh, in terms of the supply of the bombs themselves, mm -hmm. they have one of the largest supplies in the world. Maybe. And in terms of the ongoing research, that ongoing research is uh, 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 keeps progressing. And, and keeps being guarded in terms of any kind being, of uh, opaque uh, or any kind of openness uh, to the world. Society. In a place called Demona, yeah. uh, it certainly does. And the mm -hmm. other thing is, there is almost certainly, although we don't have the primary sources to look at yet, mm -hmm. but almost certainly there uh, is a working relationship in that area between the state of Israel and the United States of America. Yeah, 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 it's there and it's... it's uh, and other nations, my guess is that uh, at some point in the future, uh, other nation states in the Middle East will also have those kinds of weapons. After all, Pakistan does, yes. uh, India does. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there's a big question about Iran. At least Iran is working on developing nuclear power. Mm -hmm. uh, the charge is that by some people that that's aimed towards weapons development. Yeah. The Iranians say that's not aimed towards weapons development as mm -hmm. we know. Mm -hmm. It's aimed for, uh, for domestic purposes, mm -hmm. uh, but um, uh, given the antagonisms and the concerns, uh, we can probably, I would estimate, that we could expect that in a matter of time, we have various estimates, yeah. but in a matter of time and not too many years, uh, Iran will certainly have full nuclear capability. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, who is to say that other nation states in that area will not will also not have that capability. Pakistan does now. And Pakistan does now. Uh -huh. And Pakistan is in many ways uh, very close to uh, some of the states and some of the states in the Arab Middle East. Yeah, uh, you 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 wrote that letter, to Elmer Berger, and so forth, and so you were aware of the uh, well, you say public education, or you could say propaganda that is able to find its way into the American consciousness by the organized Jewish community, APAC and others, right? And uh, is it fair to say that they've been pretty effective in terms of getting the Zionist story into the consciousness of the American people to where a lot of people feel we are intrinsically joined at the hip, as it were, with that country in the Probably middle of that Islamic more world, which is emerging after the fall of communism as the enemy du jour in terms of the legitimacy claims of the United States and their fellow allies uh, for historical legitimacy. That lobby, as you know, called the Israel lobby, mm. uh, to answer your question, has most probably, as many scholars have pointed out, been the single most successful lobby in the United States, in the United States, for many decades. decades yeah. We now, though, have another lobby within the same context mm. that is probably uh, as significant, as important, as powerful. In fact, I would argue perhaps even more powerful than the Israel lobby, and that's the Christian Zionist lobby. My God, you and I have talked about that. The Christian yeah. Zionist, we've talked about that. They're joined at the hip. Uh, the Christian Zionist lobby, mm -hmm. uh, which is a lobby of evangelical, evangelical Christians, yeah. uh, that lobby is extremely important, and that lobby has joined with the Israel lobby. And they're well financed both? 
both are Strong extremely influence. well financed uh -huh. and they are extremely effective. And extreme. They are especially effective uh, with the uh, Congress of the United States. Congress. Yes. And they also, of course, have influenced public opinion in this country. Right. We have had uh, uh, some waves of movement other ways mm. uh, recently uh, in terms of public opinion, although uh, that opinion is still, I would say, foremost. But in Congress, we have hardly had in Congress and in the administrations, presidential administrations, mm -hmm. we have hardly had any, if any at all, movement away from full and total backing yeah. of and for the state of Israel. By that I mean political, military, and economic. Apache helicopters, gunships, unlimited, was it $4 billion a year or well, something? Or yeah, what is it? I the, guess you know. The, the official number mm -hmm. of dollars that have gone to Israel uh, every year on the average since 1967 mm -hmm. has been three to three and a half billion. Mm -hmm. But actually, when uh, various people have studied the numbers, uh, the numbers actually are far closer to five to six billion it, rather than the three and a is half. Is that both governmental and private sector? No, no. That's from the United States government. Our tax dollars. Uh, our tax dollars. Okay. And you know, we've got a commitment to that. That's, That's the largest supplier. That of government funds to there any country is, by far. There is, I guess Egypt's number two, right? Egypt has been number two since 79 mm -hmm. when, under the Camp David Agreement. Uh -huh. But at number two, it gets, let's say, one billion dollars, one billion, maybe, maybe uh, that that much. Uh -huh. So it gets, uh, of the real number, it gets maybe 20 percent. Harold, there's nothing like it. Now there is, as I'm sure you know, um, uh, we've had a great deal written on this. We have a great deal of evidence mm -hmm. for this. Uh, we had a book that was published a couple years ago that became a very important, significant, and controversial book written by two distinguished scholars, yeah. one from Harvard and one from the University of Chicago. Mm. Uh, the book is titled The Israel Lobby. Mm -hmm. The two scholars are Mearsheimer and Walt. Right. And there's nothing new that wasn't known and written about before in that book, but uh, the significance is that in one book, Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't had one book that puts it together quite as well as they put it together. Yeah, they've had a lot of influence. Another guy, Finkelstein, he, he got, uh, he's well, Norm, written on the issue. Uh, Norman and he Finkelstein was just, uh, has written cashiered, a, I think, from a university or something under pressure. Well, yes, unfortunately, Norman Finkelstein is a is an academic and mm -hmm. uh, I think a very good scholar yeah. mm -hmm. uh, who because of his uh, uh, strong anti-Zionist views right. and criticisms of certain Israeli policies uh -huh. was never really able to get a tenure track position uh -huh. in a university. Which protects and the most, you from cashiering. Which, that's right yeah. and it depends where you are and yeah, so sure. on. Yeah. Uh, but uh, and most recently, which is now just all, about almost two years ago, uh, he lost a job that he had at DePaul University in Chicago when the faculty voted to give him tenure and then the yeah, administration, administration. Uh, because of uh, obviously because of pressure from the outside right. refused to do it. Yeah, it was a, a cause celebre in a sense. It was just, indeed. Yeah. It was indeed. Also, just recently the country of Israel just wouldn't allow um, Norman, no, Noam Chomsky. Noam Chomsky to come and speak. Yes, yeah. that was a mistake that even the government realized. Part of a, lo a larger mistake that was around the flotilla and so forth, it seemed to me. In well, terms that, of Israel, well, that, in terms was, of that was, that was, that's even a, probably uh, in terms of public opinion around the world, except for in the United States, mm. the flotilla is even uh, a bigger mistake. It's in, yeah. It's but in, the Noam Chomsky thing was significant. Yeah, it was in part of a larger pattern. And, um, you know, it's just, you. I, is there anyone at the UN, I don't know if you study or not, but uh, I've done a lot of things about Kashmir and there have been, vis-a-vis -vis the United Nations and doing that, that they talk about uh, Iran not living up to a resolution, they're part of the, the, uh, the uh, proliferation treaty, but uh, there's probably no country in the world that has uh, violated or caused to have violating UN, uh, uh, UN uh, um, resolutions. resolutions than Israel. 
No, there's no question about they're, that. They're but way out in the chart, and they claim that there is a world that is, I think there's certain segments. You have, I'm Episcopalian background, you know, so I'm ha handicapped. But there are considerable segments of the Jewish population having suffered the uh, Nazi nonsense and all that sort of thing, who are of the opinion that the two groups in the world are the Jews, and then there are the rest of the world whose purpose in being is to kill all the Jews. Well, if rapid anti-Zion and uh, rapid anti, you know that kind of thing. But that thing that when they say other countries are not recognizing the UN, Israel's got the worst record in the history of the United Nations in terms of, and they claim it's anti-Semitism, which is genetically built into the species or something. Look, we can illustrate that with what just happened with this flotilla thing. We got to get to that. Okay, you know? yeah. mm. because. Uh, since that occurred, which mm -hmm. has been, the, let's say, in the last week and a half to two Yeah, weeks, right, just happened. Yeah. The major argument mm -hmm. that uh, uh, Netanyahu, Israel's prime minister, mm -hmm. makes, he puts the arguments for the flotilla and for uh, the boycott, he puts it into a context, and the context he put it into that has raised him to, a ver to the highest point ever of his popularity in Israel. In Israel overall? In, in Israel, really? even though there is a minority Jewish opinion the other way, mm -hmm. but uh, the contextual framework is, this is the public opinion around the world that criticizes Israel. Netanyahu said, mm -hmm. uh, clearly, more than once, he said, this is the old story of the world against us. Yeah. By us, yeah. he means yeah. Jews, yeah, right. not just Israelis, right, right, right. and the reverse of that, uh -huh. of therefore and thereby, us against the world. Yeah. Now, the point is, yeah. it's not only this government, mm -hmm. it's been every Israeli government, actually, during the 62 years of existence, yeah. especially since 19. 67, yeah. uh, every Israeli government has felt this way basically about world opinion. Yeah. We don't care right. about opinion in any other country of the world except for the United States. Right. And in the United States, we really care mostly, almost solely, about the United States government because it's the United States government that supports us economically, militarily, and politically, and has made and has provided our economic economic cushion, protects us politically, and has made us into the third or fourth most powerful military nation state in the world, mm -hmm. which is pretty amazing when it, you look at the size. Yeah, that's right. That's amazing. So they're in that position, and there are Fort Apache out there on the frontier. Well, and then they, something. And, and we've also gone through where it used to be. You can remember McCarthy and everything, and it was a the enemy du jour of the uh, geopolitical system of the world run or out of the Second World War by the United States, by and large, George Kennan, containment, all of that. It was the, it was the communists. They were the enemy, uh, right. COINTELPRO, the whole thing. But it seems to be that the enemy du jour, if we would put it now, uh, it seems to be uh, the one that's being uh, positioned in the consciousness of Americans is, is Islam. Uh, uh, that's the enemy du jour. It used to be the commies. Yeah, I think that uh, that's Do you think unfortunately that's true. That's going on. I think that's unfortunately true. I mean, we can't say that that's a. F we can't generalize fully and totally because there are, of course, Americans, individuals, and groups that uh, also um, uh, are opposed to that kind of uh, to that point of view. But certainly, that's it. Look, we have it. We're sitting in the middle of Manhattan. Mm -hmm. Look, this, here's a tiny illustration of it. Uh -huh. uh, there is an American Islamic group mm -hmm. that has no ties with Al Qaeda or any of those extreme groups, uh -huh. and they um, uh, have the area of the land and they want to build a mosque. Down at ground zero. Down by ground zero, mm -hmm. and we have all these people. That, have, that are objecting because they say with no evidence they're tied to Al Qaeda. That's the worst kind of Islam, and so on. Well, they're so also the enemy. They're the they're, they're, the they're, enemy. they're the us, them. They're the them. That's, that's the right. them, and that serves the interests of right. Israel. Look, let me tell you that uh, there's a new book that's just come out okay. called. Um, uh, 
where, the, Islam in the eyes of the West. And I have a... Uh, um, uh, well, uh, there are a number of people who have written chapters, and one of our directors, a good friend named Tyrek Ismail, mm. who's, a, who's one of the great authorities uh, on Iraq and the Middle East, is mm. the editor. And I have a chapter there in that book, mm. and that chapter uh, is the Christian Zionist view yeah, yeah, yeah. of Islam. Yeah, you've written and it that. couldn't be worse. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, from a good many of these uh, ministers who, who have, yeah. Yeah, who have huge congregations, yeah. Islam is evil, mm -hmm. it's totally evil, mm -hmm. it comes from the devil, mm -hmm. and so yeah, on and right, so on right, and so on. Right, 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 right. Well, that's, there. that's what makes it so dangerous in a sense. That's and right. Things like those things are very firmly, firmly held. So the new center that you're doing, you're involved in research and so forth. And I know you've also reached out to a number of diplomats. You're a friend of the ambassador, or you're you have association with the uh, ambassador of Syria, the United well, States. Well, he's an well old known. friend of mine. Yeah, you know, you got he a lot of old friends oh. and that sort of thing. You're in touch with a lot of people, and you've also had some communication. And I watched a program. I was surprised that you had some connection with. Uh, the Lubavitch, you know, that kind of thing, Orthodox yeah. Jewish. That was interesting. I belong to but a then, Chabad uh, Lubavitch congregation right here in Manhattan on that, the east side. Is that your congregation and tie to Judaism? Is that the tie you have, or do you count that a tie, or is it just at a social level, or are you committed no, no, to, I the, count, to the Rebbe, no. or no, or what? Yeah. Yeah. I count <laughs> that as a tie for a variety of reasons that I could specify, mm. but that certainly does not mean that I am in agreement with all of the positions that Chabad Lubavitch puts. I'm in happy fact, to hear that. In fact, got, I'm, I, I well, loved you heard my talk, I know, right? it was great, uh, it was great. Uh, you heard <laughs> yeah, my criticism. Yeah, right, yeah, it was. But I love them, they got the mitzvah mobile, and they, they come over in the street, young men, they, are you Jewish, <laughs> you know, and everything. I love them and everything, but I mean, I, and I did a program with a fellow about that. I was surprised, I hadn't realized it, but we live in the Christian era, 2010 is the year, but in the Jewish it's 5,771. I never well, knew what yeah. that was. Uh -huh. What was that marking? I didn't know. But I was told no. by the Lubavitch that that was when everything in the universe was created, 2,772 years ago. The belief is that, that that's right. <laughs> God created a, the world 5,770 years ago. The whole universe. Right, the all whole at once. universe. Yeah. And when you ask, well, what about all of the scientific <laughs> evidence that takes you back millions, if not billions of years? In fact, Literally to the rabbi yeah. of this congregation I go to, whom I really like, yeah. I've a I asked him at one point when I first joined, mm. have you gone to the Museum of Natural History here uh, um, uh, in uh, New York City and yeah. seen that great uh, 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 film program they yeah. have? Yeah. And he said, yes, and I've taken my children. So when I asked him, well, what about that? He says, look, he said, God is capable of oh, doing any, anything. anything. And so what scientifically may indicate millions or billions of years, no, God did it. And then he says, after all, uh, this is another one of their beliefs. He said, when God put the first person on earth, Adam, he didn't put him on as a, as a baby. He put him on as a 21-year-old. So... <laughs> So, well, so there you are, and so, mm -hmm. and then, and you know, and then the other part of the answer is uh -huh. a, a, a typical answer, not only from them but from other religious people. Yeah, religion uh, in general. Uh, that's right. Yeah. Uh, that the answer is: look, we're human beings, and our knowledge and reasoning ability can only go so far, and so we cannot understand God's ways. Right. So whenever there's a rational question mm -hmm. that cannot be answered in any rational way, that's the answer. <laughs> so as I always say, yeah. and my rabbi and I now laugh about yeah, it, right. I always that's say, good, that's, yeah. the non, that's the non- answer from the religious. Yeah, it's right, the non-answer. Yeah, right, right, right. So sometimes mm. when we get to other questions yeah. and I say, well, how can this be? He said, it's the non-answer from the religious for you. Enough already. So yeah, right, the right. Com Listen, yeah. if you believe it, let me tell you this. Yeah. One day, a few weeks ago, mm. I was at dinner at my rabbi's house and yeah. he had his 
father-in-law, mm. who's the top Chabad rabbi in the Vancouver area of Canada. Okay. And we were at dinner, and we were talking, and he said, well, he believed this or that. Yeah, uh, and I said, you know, you believe it, but you really cannot expect that other people would believe the same just because you believe it. He said, no, you don't have it right. He said, it's not that I believe it. Mm -hmm. He said, I know it. Uh -huh, yeah, so, I mean, yeah. that. so that's with that, there's no argument. Yeah, that's right. Any yeah. people, whether they're Lubovitch Jews or other Jews or Christians or Muslims or whatever they are, anyone who believes mm -hmm. that she or he has the word of God, mm -hmm. there's no argument yeah, with that no argument person. Yeah, argument with that because that's a, that's a thing. And, and you got 80% of the population thinking those well, kind of terms. Well, that's a problem. Uh, that, that, that is, to my that way That affects thinking. the Middle East as well, of Yeah, it does indeed. And because, as I was saying, you have touch with them, but you also have touch with a great number of other people from the area, including you've been in communication with some of the people of the Hamas persuasion. Well, on and March... And that's something that is very interesting because... Uh, the Fatah and Hamas thing, and in Gaza they won an election, and they're the authority, and they're the ones that there seems to be a, they don't seem to want to accept the legitimacy claims of the state of Israel from the get-go. Am I right in understanding well, let me they've comment got that? On that? Or where do they stand? And talk a little bit about Hamas. Okay. Well, first of all, on March 18th, just mm -hmm. this last March 18th, mm -hmm. a month and a half ago, mm -hmm. in Damascus, I had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Khalid Mashal, wow. who is the top political yeah. leader of Hamas. Actually, okay. it was one-on-two -on -two because Usama Hamdan, who's the head of international relations for mm -hmm. Hamas, was also there. You've met with uh, with uh, the head, president of Syria, too? Yes, you? yes, I yeah. have. Okay, yeah. But, uh, the, and yeah. when I came back, actually, I wrote two emails to Daniel Shapiro, uh, who's a Middle East expert for Obama in the White House, okay. explaining that I did this. Mm -hmm. So I talked with him, yeah. and he went over the position of Hamas. Now, after more recently, about two weeks ago, yeah. Charlie Rose yeah. had an interview that he had on his program yes. with the same Khalid Mashal, where he went, where he said the same thing that he, that he to said to me. Uh -huh. Now, did you record that interview? Um, uh, did you yeah, video record, record it? Yeah, that was uh, video, video, video. Yeah, you did. Rose. No, uh, you. Did you record my your own? Video? Yeah. No, I didn't record. You ought to get mine. a little webcam. You could be doing. That well, I suggest. Uh, I'm I'll do it next video. time. Do, I'll do please. It. Because when I go back to Damascus, anytime mm. he's there, mm. I can also, and I will. Indeed. You have a good relation. You, uh, you can talk. Oh, we can talk. That's very important. That doesn't mean That's very total important. agreement one What's way. What's the background of Hamas? Uh, you spell well, it out in your thing, just, you know, as a political thing. It arose from the... Oh, go ahead. It actually arose... Uh, in opposition to In opposition Fatah. to Fatah, because yeah. Fatah was uh, actually internally pretty corrupt. Uh -huh. And uh, Hamas arose as a... As a uh, uh, political and religious grouping, when, but also when, when did uh, it, in the, it started in the late 80s, late coming into 80s, the 90s, okay, coming yeah. into the 90s, right. and uh, it also uh, uh, provided a good deal more social services uh, for uh, Palestinians who were needy uh, than did Fatah. Big and, need there, isn't oh, there? Oh, yeah, and that's yeah. really what uh, that's really what made them so popular. Uh -huh. That in 2006, it's like the Black Hamas, Hamas won. Uh, the Palestinian e election, yeah. which was a, which was really um, a, a very democratic election. Did that come out of the blue? Did they know that was going to happen? Could no, they know the it was guess, happening? Was the, it a the surprise? The estimates were particularly the, in Gaza. The estimates were well, they 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 won it overall. The estimates were. The estimates were that Hamas would win because the Arafat, uh, uh, Fatah leadership uh, had become uh, probably since the 80s well, they, so corrupt. They had been fighting an uphill battle against a power that had become very, very powerful. And most of the things in the human condition have to do with some people who are very rich, strong, militarily strong and powerful and able to subject or to intimidate others. And so in that case, you had that with Israel, had that ability. And so there was a, so Mr. Arafat and so where they put a tank, turret, a, a gun, gun right into his, right into his place up in uh, Rabat, Ramah. Well, that's what the Israelis did. Yeah, they yeah, but, they but there was this the with the Habas, uh, with the, uh, so that still goes on. The distinction between the position of, uh, of uh, Fatah and uh, Hamas. 
All right. Well, in terms wait. of their attitude towards, towards Israel, Israel, and what actually, are the basic let, principle let, let differences? Let me give you. Let me give you the Hamas position, yeah. which is actually the same as the. Did Bob you Bob. audio record that tape with him? What? Did you have an audio tape? No, record? I didn't do mine, but you but he said the same thing to Charlie Rose, you can get it. He also said the same thing in an interview that he had before that with the Wall Street Journal. Was he Wall Street Journal. Was he fulsome and forthcoming with Rose? Uh, very and he was very Is forth he articulate? He number one, he was forthcoming. Number two, he's articulate. Number three, the political position, which I'll outline, Thank is you. very clear in regard to Israel. Okay. And it's the same as Fatah. It's the same as the League of Arab States. It's the same as all of the near Arab nation-state governments. And, and the a good deal of the is, United Nations. Uh, that's right. The position is that uh, we accept, we would accept a Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza Israel would have to return to its pre-June 1967 borders, then, uh, and that would mean we would have a state and there would be the state of, of Israel, mm -hmm. and the Hamas position clearly stated many times by the Hamas leadership, especially in the last three and a half to four years, mm -hmm. is that we would have our state and Israel would be a state, there would be relations between the two states, and the form of the relations, diplomatic relations, would be as the Palestinians in the Palestinian state voted, and the Hamas leadership would go along with that fully and totally. That's now, important now, now, stance, now, yeah. now. Mm. That is certainly not a position that the state of Israel accepts the government mm -hmm. because they don't intend to return to the pre-June 1967 Sure border. seems that way. But, 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 I would say that that is certainly a reasonable and legitimate negotiating position for one of the parties of the conflict to begin to, uh, to, to begin with at the table. And the Hamas leadership says they would and they want to come to the table to negotiate. We would expect that we should expect that in any conflict, be it this kind of conflict, even be it a labor conflict, that the parties to the conflict will come to the table and put their maximal positions on the table well, to, to start. Why? Because if they're coming for negotiations, they know that if the negotiations progress anywhere towards a settlement, there will have to be compromises yeah. on both sides. So they will want to compromise from, from their maximal strong... positions. Yeah. So I'm saying that is a reasonable position for beginning. Now then, now well, then. Okay, that I also can talk mean, to that, but right, go ahead. That also means, mm -hmm. that also means yeah. that the Hamas position is not what we hear in all of the Zionist Israeli propaganda that Hamas only wants to destroy the whole state of Israel. It's not that at all. And let me say one okay, other thing. That's interesting there is a demand, to me. There, and, mm -hmm. uh, and the Hamas leadership and all of the Arabs are asked the same question. Mm -hmm. There is well, a demand. They, they have there, that Abdullah there thing is, where the, right, the, there the Arab states demand. are ready. There is a demand. Mm -hmm. There is a demand by the Israeli government. Uh, it's a condition that before we, the Israeli government, start negotiations, that the that the Palestinians and the Arabs have to accept the legitimate existence of Israel as a Jewish state. Now, that's not saying just recognize the existence of Israel. All of these groups, including Hamas, oh, they're there. recognize, recognize yeah. the existence. Yeah. That's saying Israel is a Jewish state. The kind of Jewish state it is now is a Jewish Zionist state, which is an exclusive state, which by law and therefore public policy grants rights and privileges to Jews not granted to non-Jews, and is a state that has continually oppressed the non-Jewish indigenous population of the Palestinians. Is a now, part I, that's I, right. Is a part uh, I yes, strong? that's part of it. Mm -hmm. Now, now, to expect mm -hmm. that Palestinians especially, but any of the Arabs, are going to say, we accept that legitimately, we, legi we, we accept that kind of state as a legitimate state, that's to expect too much. To say we are willing to accept 
a state of Israel here, even a Zion a state that may be different than, than, than this state is, that's another story. So there's, so there's no hesitation to accept the realistic existence of the state of Israel, but we should not expect reasonably that any of the Arabs are going to say, we accept everything Israel has done and everything Israel is as being legitimate. Look, let me give an analogy finally. Okay. To my knowledge, from 1917, at the time of the Russian Revolution, after which the Soviet Union came into existence, until the Soviet Union collapsed in the latter part of the 1980s, mm -hmm. certainly the United States government recognized the existence of the Soviet Union. Certainly there were relations, but to my knowledge, we had no government of the United States ever say, <laughs> ever say yeah. that we accept the legitimacy of that state. In fact, the the argument was yeah. not that it's legitimate. Mm -hmm. The argument was that's the evil empire. Yeah, that's what Mr. Reagan said, didn't he? Yeah, that's right. So and you're also you're also in a certain sense given the realities of uh, the way the world set up, geo realpolitik, and so forth. That the powerful shoe in that is the Israeli position. They have unlimited support in terms of, uh, of, the, uh, of uh, the military support. They are. It's like is there an analogy? Is it wrong? or one wonders is uh, they have all their historical claims and their story and everything like that. But in the case of the North American continent, when the Europeans came, there were Indian nations, and there was no way that the Indian nations were going to be able to stand up to the incru incursion of uh, very technologically advanced uh, European peoples and that kind of thing. So what they did in a certain sense was to treat the American Indian nations with great abandon in terms of any ethics, and they would just run Russia out over any treaties. It was like quasi-conquest. All right. And Look. the Israelis are the conquerors. They no. won 67. Not. We've won. There are rights to conquest. You will do what you're told. That's the attitude of powerful people throughout the colonial period and in general. So that's one that motivates them. And Every says, we're the strong. You will do what you're told. Every Israeli government, especially since now they'll ma they'll they'll just sugarcoat it. Every that's Israeli what it is. government, especially since '67, mm -hmm. has had what I call a short-term view, mm -hmm. and the short-term view is what you just said. We have what we want. We have the power. So really. I would say none of them have really wanted to give that up and to really, really to no. negotiate seriously. They would expand but, but, with that but, power yeah, in but, an expansive well, way in which what yes. they're doing. All right. but, East Jerusalem but, now. That's right. But they have a very big, serious problem. They sure and do. And the big, serious problem is the demography. Mm -hmm. If one goes to Israel and walks down the street mm -hmm. and picks out people, from government officials to uh, whoever's sweeping the, the street, mm -hmm. at the Jews, uh -huh. and you ask them, what do you consider to be the biggest Jewish, the biggest Jewish problem? Jews like to talk about the Jewish problem. I know Irish like to talk about the Irish problem. Mm -hmm. Greeks like, all right, mm -hmm. yeah. like to talk yeah. about the Greek problem. Yeah. If you ask them, most of them will not say suicide bombers. Mm -hmm. They will say demography, population. Why? Because here is Israel. 5.7 million is the last census. Of the 5.7 million citizens, 1.3 are Palestinians. So that means we're talking about four and a half million Jews. Right, that's what there I There are mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. there are as many, pal almost as many Palestinians today in Israel as it is, with the occupied territories of the West You're Bank and Gaza, in, yeah, yeah. as the West Bank and Gaza, as there are Israeli Jews. Mm -hmm. uh, last September, there were at least as many Palestinian kindergarten children in schools in all of Israel, including mm -hmm. the occupied territories, mm -hmm. as there were Jewish school children. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the Palestinians have one of the highest, if not the highest, birth rate in the world. Israeli mm -hmm. Jews have one of the lowest birth rates in the and world. And a lot of them are. So, wearing shifts uh, 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 well, all right, uh, not, all, right. all over. But yeah. now, now, mm. so that means that that very soon, the goodly majority mm -hmm. of those people who live there are going to be non-Jews. And if you then look at Israel, where it sits in the middle of the Arab Middle East, right, with 
a few hundred million mm -hmm. of non-Jews. Well, yeah, and you got then, one, 1 1.5 billion Muslims. That, not that's the least, right. Not then, less. that's right. With that and then, Kashmir. Yeah. Then that's the worry because that nation state that has this military superiority today mm -hmm. and a little superiority in a few other ways may well not have that superiority at some point in the future. Uh -huh. They will for the next few years, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but maybe not in the future. And if you also talk then mm -hmm. to a good many Arabs in the Arab Middle East yeah. and Palestinians, what do they tell you? They tell you, well, okay, it took us a long time, many decades, into a century or more to get rid of the Crusaders, yeah. but we got rid of them <coughs> because we just outpopulated them. Mm -hmm. So the view there, and by the way, Israeli Jews know this view, mm -hmm. the view is that could well happen in the future. And, and, and if you're going to go all of the time until that happens, mm -hmm. and if you as the superior power for that length of time are going to keep oppressing and antagonizing people, then maybe when the end time comes, the end time could come, and I hope this really never happens, the could come in a most violent way. Yeah, 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 it could be building up because they're building yeah. up, uh, they got it the could. arrogance of power, it and could. they've got the power. And, and I hope it power. doesn't. Yeah. So I would say uh -huh. to people who are more concerned about for Jews than they are for non-Jews, mm -hmm. which I'm not. Mm -hmm. I think you need to have a broad humanitarian concern and be as concerned for uh, any uh, people in the world. Yeah. But for those, yeah. and we unfortunately have those, yeah, have, who yeah. are more concerned uh, for Jews for than for non-Jews, I would yeah. say that they, Mm -hmm. If they're really concerned for Jews mm -hmm. and the future of Jews in Israel, mm -hmm. they had better be concerned about changing how that state is mm -hmm. if they want to have safety and well-being for Jews at some time in the future. They don't seem to be exhibiting that. They, they just, don't. They, they just went to East Jerusalem. They got, they, it's all banter stands out in the West Bank. There are people who see it. What do you see? One state, two state? What do you see in terms of that? And then again, back to the Hamas, why do they have such a brief, existential brief against Hamas? If you say that Who? Hamas, Israel, Israeli government, they ha you say Hamas and, and Fatah and the Arab states all agree to this idea that you laid out in terms of what they do, it they seems close. What differentiates Hamas in such a way that they've put this horrible uh, Hamas blockade around Gaza and letting right. it become Hamas a big become prison the camp? Hamas and then you has, got the flotilla. Hamas has become the major enemy. Now, there is, I'll tell you, wait, wait. Yeah. First of all, you know when Hamas first got started? Yeah, you said in the 80s. The Israeli so. government mm -hmm. actually helped Hamas against saying, Fatah because, they were, so against because Fatah. they were so against Fatah. Now, mm -hmm. now, why? Uh, for That's these, like being against wait. Martin King and getting Malcolm. For, the, for, 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 for these, the major reason and they, there's some, some point to this, but it's not in full context. The major reason is that those Palestinians, one and a half million plus of them, have been so oppressed by yeah. the Israelis yeah. in Gaza mm -hmm. that as one might expect for, from any group of people mm -hmm. so oppressed, some turned to violence. Mm -hmm. And it I, is true, and it is true mm -hmm. that there were rockets that were shot. Yeah. From, from, uh, Gaza. from Gaza into mm -hmm. Israel. Mm -hmm. Of course, those rockets, Are which were not very sophisticated, yeah. uh, uh, killed very, very few people yeah. and so on. And Hamas, uh, two years at least before uh, we had the Israeli incursion, the Hamas leader said, we'll really put a stop to all of this if we sit down and negotiate with you, if you'll negotiate with us, which the Israelis wouldn't do. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, uh, the Israeli argument is that's why we have a blockade. That's why we don't want things going in because we're concerned that there will be weapons coming in. Yeah. And the other reason is uh, uh, the Israeli government since Oslo in 1993 mm -hmm. has been able most of the time, not all the time, mm -hmm. to get the Fatah leadership to go along 
with them in how they want to appear to be moving when they really aren't yeah. towards peaceful resolution. Mm -hmm. The Hamas people wouldn't go along with that because they always saw that this was just um, uh, maneuvering. Buyout, a buyout, a sellout. Uh, that's right. Yeah, that's co option. Right. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I, we have a lot of those reasons. Mm -hmm. Finally, you asked me a, a question that we should uh, maybe reserve for our next conversation. Next conversation. Uh, one one state, uh, all right. yeah. one state or two states, yeah. you ask me how I feel. I once uh, gave I'll, you 30 seconds to explain anti-Semitism. No, wait a minute. Remember one of our conversations? Well, all right. I'm going to <laughs> 30 give seconds, you, sir. Well, 30 seconds. Haiku, please. All I can say is this. <laughs> yeah. I can just give you, you ask my opinion? Yeah. I think that a fair two-state settlement is a dead letter. You really do. I don't do. think it's possible. You really do. And I, and I, and yeah, so. They push so that's hard. Right. Yeah. Wait a minute. Okay. I think that a one state, we have one state. Yeah. It's just that it's a state that's oppressive. For that one apartheid? state. Apartheid? Uh, yeah, it, but it we is have apartheid. one state. Yeah, yes, okay. it is. But, I, but I'm saying, yeah. but, and, for, and I think that we are quite a ways away, unfortunately, from that one state being changed into a more democratic state for all the people there, not just for the Jews. But I say that, that violates in, that their in, principle. Well, I, I would say yeah. that in that in that, that that for moral reasons, ethical reasons, for humanitarian reasons, I favor a one-state solution for a state that would guarantee by law, which Israel does not do, mm -hmm. everybody uh, rights and privileges fairly for everybody. Uh -huh. And I would also suggest that although we're a long ways from that, mm -hmm. that Palestinians might be well advised to realize that a fair two-state solution is out of the question and that therefore they have, there are um, uh, three and a half million Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza that have never been allowed to be citizens. Yeah. That's the indigenous population, and they would have a pretty good argument if they said, you know, we don't want a state of our own. We're three and a half million. We want to become, we want to become citizens yeah. of the state of Israel. We're and a basic right, human yeah. right is the citizenship right. That'd be a civil rights movement. That yeah. would be quite a good thing to do. And I would say that they would be well advised on a moral level, an ethical level, and also on a practical level, not to try to do it by violence, but to do it by nonviolent means. Okay, that might be, in that's very interesting. You think that there's signs of that being able to happen? I don't know. Uh, well, I'll be. tell you, if we and go you got the on PR, and, and they've got this thing, this dual use thing. There's, it, we invoke it also. I remember talking to Nita Renfrew. You might know Nita. And there was when they were had dual use things for Iraq, and there was a, a shipment of pencils that were not allowed in because the graphite might be ground down to make it. So dual use, it means essentially that you cannot have anything that might possibly become a threat to us. They build an elect electric producing generating plant in uh, Atomic in Akrak, and they unilaterally went and bombed it. Okay? They're talking about that now. They've got the teeth in the, the Brit in their mouth, that is the Israeli people. And you've also got a public relations pressure being put upon them for this thing with the flotilla, nine killed, that kind of thing. Really a strong thing. So that the Islamic world and the, and the, the, the Islamic world, which is merging and so forth, if the pressure becomes down to where instead of saying, well, please, accept, we'll accept whatever you say attitude that they have, the Israelis have, toward the, the region and that sort of thing. We, we're the strong ones. You're the Indian tribe out on the frontier. But if they become stronger and the pressure is really put upon Israel at an existential level, they just threw, what's her name, the, large, the longest running, who was it, the, the, Elizabeth Th Thomas? Thomas? No. Th for saying that, uh, for saying that uh, the, the, the Jews who came from Europe and were persecuted in Europe, uh, ought to go back to Europe, give them Berli B Bavaria or something, the pressure would be put upon Israel to not be accepted from the get-go, from 48, that it was irresponsible and not legitimate. That position could be taken by a strongly resurgent and uh, uh, geopolitically strong 
rather than one that has to kowtow to the situation that either America or Israel dictates, as they have been doing to be in the international order, that that would put tremendous existential pressure. Mr. Le Mr. Netanyahu says that, that no such thing, you know, that the pressure is there. It's very dangerous because they do have 400 weapons, and they have a, a strongly felt sense of persecution and of, of commitment to their own values and so forth. And they've got these weapons that we don't even know about, and they not want to have anybody else that could even have the ability to become a threat to them. It's like saying, we can have the Gatling gun, you can have the pea shooter kind of attitude toward the world. But if that reverses, that would put pressure and it would be very, very dangerous that they will in an existential thing. If we're going down, everybody's going down and pull the trigger on the species. Very dangerous. Well, that's very, what makes... Very, very dangerous. You think that? That is, huh? It's a danger. Okay, and the idea... It's a is, worry. Yeah, the, the, the major worry, because that's the major worry confronting us all. Uh, that that per part of the world. Well, uh, I don't know. Kashmir is very dangerous, but the the idea of you the know Islam I'm going in October. We got to be in touch with the Islamic world, and you're being in touch with some well, of the people in the Islamic world. Well, I'll tell you, you, you we mentioned. can't just write them off as communists. No, in fact, and no COINTEL pro in October. Thing in mm -hmm. October, yeah. October 2nd, I'm going with a very good friend of mine, Ibrahim Abu Rabi, who's a major Islamic theologian mm -hmm. uh, and philosopher. Yeah. I'm going to a big Islamic conference in Istanbul. Okay. And I'm going to talk there. I'm going to be, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to talk as a Jew. Yeah. And then Ibrahim Abu Rabi and I were going on a lecture tour, just the two of us, Where? to Pakistan, India, and Kashmir. Wonderful. That's really good. Do your work. That's and pretty good. Let me also tell you that I have just received an invitation to, by uh, the Association of University and College Professors and Teachers in Gaza to come to Gaza to lecture. Hope they let you now, in. They wouldn't well, let no one in. No, no, no. Yeah. Now, um, whether I can go or not. Uh, uh, by your schedule. Yeah. Well, no. Mm. I will arrange <laughs> to go on my schedule. <laughs> I, I'm almost sure that I couldn't go to Israel and have Israel let me in. Mm -hmm. If I went, I would probably have to go to Egypt and go in through the Rafah gate. They've opened it now. They've they? opened it, where? and I could probably do that. Mm -hmm. And the only thing I really want to check on is if I do that, mm -hmm. which I really want to do, yeah. and I think it would be important, mm -hmm. uh, uh, could that mean that uh, that might... Um, uh, cause an Israeli government when I uh, wanted to go to Israel not to let me in uh, at all. I see. You have to balance I have to check on that. Yeah, okay. And, but I will indeed, but I want to go to Gaza. Check it off very carefully and keep up the good work. It's been your pleasure, Perception, one of the major voices in terms of trying to address this existentially most significant problem confronting humanity as we come up to a time of... Uh, really in, incredible importance and so forth. It's getting very, very, the flotilla thing set off a, a thing. There will be more of that. There will be pressures put. There's going to be the existential threat of uh, Iran, as they say. This kind of thing is coming to a point, and it's the most important issue that has to be dealt with, and I'm glad it's in a uh, considerable degree in the hands of you, my friend. Well, because you're it's not all in my hands. Yeah, it isn't all in your hands? <laughs> no. Well, put it all in your hands. Maybe you can call on no. Gene Wilder, your, read, your roommate. You yeah, he was my Gene roommate Wilder in college. And maybe get a little humor into this thing, too. Because well, that, that, helps. that would certainly help. They have help. a good sense of humor on the Hamas side when you deal um, with them. Is there humor well, there? Can you get to humor this way? Yeah, of, uh, no, some of them do. Jews By the way, it, Hall you know? Hall Hall Jews are very good. They are really good. Where would we be uh, without Jews them? are about the best. Yeah, in community care. Uh, <laughs> right, I think so. Yeah, they get yes, that. That's yeah. right. That's yeah, right. yeah. That's right. Well, anyway, thanks for coming. Your pleasure. Carol, thank you again. You know, it's always a pleasure talking to you. Keep up the good work. I'm glad you found that position in Washington. You found time to put this together. This is going to air next Tuesday, so it's a very important question and one I don't know, it seems to me. We ought to get in touch with the scholars within, and not only the scholars, but also people. I just did a young fellow. He has a very fundamentalist thing, but he's also tied up to my guy, Kelso, and to the idea of economic theory. And there are parts of the Islamic thing that has not got around the proscription against interest called Sharia compliant that might be an intellectual challenge to the level of economics, which informs all politics, from the Islamic quarters, not the revolutionary gun-toting, but the intellectual challenge to a model that we're being challenged with our economic meltdown and everything. We may get answers from Islamic quarters, uh, serious answers to what the problems confronting the broader world. 
So we Maybe could pick up help. on that too. Well, look, we've been talking and they forgot to put it to black, so we might as well stop because it's over. Okay. Okay, uh, thanks. Thank, thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay, that last mic might go up on two. Okay. okay, good. All right, I think that was all right, Harold. <laughs> <laughs> I, told you, I told you on the telephone, you're, you're better than, if it's Westinghouse, it's better than Miss, 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 um, you know. Harold, you're always very kind. Well, it's a welcome. When you find quality, it's good to be kind. Anyway, i got to strike this set, and we got to get going, and we're just about going to make it, yeah. Okay. So, you're in New York and everything? Yeah.